Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum and the special exhibit, Jacqueline Kennedy Entertains, The Art of the White House Dinner. I'm Frank Rigg, curator of the museum at the Kennedy Presidential Library. Jacqueline Kennedy's work to restore the rooms and furnishings of the White House transformed it from a place where the president worked and lived into what she called an emblem of the American Republic, which she would use as a stage for the celebration of intellectual and artistic excellence. Jacqueline Lee Bouvier was born on July 28, 1929, in Southampton, New York. Her father, John Venu Bouvier III, was an affluent Wall Street stockbroker whose ancestors had arrived from France in the early 1800s. Her mother, Janet Lee Bouvier, an accomplished equestrian, was of Irish and English parentage. Jackie spent her childhood in New York City and Long Island. Later, following her mother's divorce in 1940 and remarriage to Hugh D. Auchincloss II in 1942, she lived in McLean, Virginia and Newport, Rhode Island. Her favorite pastimes were reading, sketching, writing poems, and riding horses. Jackie attended Miss Porter's school in Connecticut and Vassar College, where she excelled in history, literature, art, and French. After studying in France for her junior year in 1949, she returned to the United States to earn a degree in French literature from George Washington University. Her first job was in 1952 as the inquiring camera girl for the Washington Times Herald, roving the city with her camera to capture citizens' reactions to issues of the day. During this time, Jackie met the young senator from Massachusetts, John F. Kennedy. They were married on September 12, 1953, at St. Mary's Church in Newport, Rhode Island. A crowd of 3,000 onlookers waited outside the church for a glimpse of the newlyweds. Afterwards, 1,200 guests attended the wedding reception at Hammersmith Farm, the nearby Auchincloss estate, a place filled with happy memories for Jacqueline of the summers she had spent there with her mother and stepfather, brothers and sisters. Following their wedding, the Kennedys lived in the Georgetown section of Washington. During her husband's convalescence from major back surgery in 1955, she encouraged his interest in writing Profiles in Courage, a study of principled political decision-making that he dedicated to her. The book won the 1957 Pulitzer Prize for biography. A momentous year for the Kennedys as their first child, Caroline Bouvier Kennedy, was born that November. In January 1960, Senator John F. Kennedy announced his candidacy for the presidency of the United States, launching 11 months of cross-country campaigning. A few weeks into the campaign, Jacqueline became pregnant, and her doctors instructed her to remain at home. There she answered campaign mail, taped TV commercials, gave interviews, and wrote Campaign Wife, a syndicated column carried across the nation. Celebration of a Kennedy election victory was followed just weeks later by celebration of the birth of the Kennedy's second child, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Jr. At age 31, Jacqueline Kennedy had become the third youngest First Lady in our history and the first to be the mother of an infant since the beginning of the 20th century. As she told an interviewer, if you bungle raising your children, nothing else much matters in life. So she determined from the start to shelter John and Caroline from the limelight associated with their father's position. Jacqueline Kennedy quickly stepped into her new role. Her first major project was the historical restoration of the White House. In 1941, 12-year-old Jacqueline Kennedy first visited the White House as a tourist with her mother and sister. She was dismayed to see so few historical furnishings on display and frustrated by the lack of a booklet to inform visitors about the history of the great house. Twenty years later, prior to her husband's inauguration, Mrs. Kennedy visited the White House as the guest of First Lady Mamie Eisenhower. At first very disappointed with the White House, Mrs. Kennedy referred to it as that dreary Maison Blanche. Calling it an 18th century house, she believed that it should be furnished with antiques in the style of past presidents. She thought it should have museum status and should emulate the history of the United States. 
she set out to change things and make the White House the most perfect house in the United States. To raise funds for the project, Mrs. Kennedy initiated the idea of a White House guidebook that could be bought by tourists visiting the White House. Though many thought it undignified to sell souvenirs at the White House, Mrs. Kennedy was unrelenting. She saw it as a convenience for those who had come so far to see the mansion. She also thought it a great way to inform the public of the historical significance of many of the rooms and furnishings. The book was finally published, and the results were more than successful. Within six months, some 350,000 copies were sold. All these people come to see the White House, and they see practically nothing that dates back before 1948, Mrs. Kennedy said in a September 1, 1961 interview with Hugh Sidey of Life magazine. Everything in the White House must have a reason for being there. It would be sacrilege merely to redecorate it, a word I hate. It must be restored, and that has nothing to do with decoration. This is a question of scholarship. She then set out to find and to retrieve for the White House, through donations, many of the original furnishings of past presidents. Such pieces had either left the White House at the end of a president's term or had been sold. Thus she established the White House Historical Association, and this committee began the search for objects once belonging to former residents of the White House. She appointed a fine arts committee to help relocate relevant antique furniture and raise funds to purchase items that would restore the White House to reflect its rich history. Within a few months, they unearthed furniture belonging to George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses Grant, James Madison, James Monroe, and Martin Van Buren. Mrs. Kennedy worked closely with her husband in furnishing the Oval Office, paying special attention to his interest in maritime history and love of the sea. Among the items she found within the White House was a desk made from the timbers of the British sailing ship, the frigate HMS Resolute, presented by Queen Victoria in 1878 to President Rutherford B. Hayes. Mrs. Kennedy had it dusted off and moved into the Oval Office, where it remains today. An exact replica of the desk can be found in the Kennedy Library and Museum's Oval Office exhibit. Once Mrs. Kennedy's restoration of the White House was nearly complete, she hosted a television tour that was broadcast by CBS to more than 50 million Americans on February 14, 1962. So well received was this tour, the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences awarded Mrs. Kennedy an honorary Emmy Award for her achievement. Other undertakings supported by Mrs. Kennedy were the renewal of Pennsylvania Avenue, the preservation of Lafayette Square across from the White House, and plans for a national cultural complex, which eventually became the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C. Her interest in preservation extended beyond the United States and included her involvement in the rescue of the ancient Egyptian temples at Abu Simbel, threatened by the floodwaters created by the Aswan Dam. So appreciative was Egyptian President Abdel Nasser of her efforts that he presented Mrs. Kennedy with the priceless antiquity of a three-foot Egyptian statue of a man from 2400 BC. This gift is on permanent display in the First Lady exhibit. Mrs. Kennedy's enthusiasm for the historical preservation movement contributed to its growing influence throughout the nation and enhanced Americans' understanding and appreciation of their heritage. As First Lady, Jacqueline Kennedy planned state occasions notable for their elegance and uplifting presentations by great performing artists, transforming the White House into a showcase for cultural and intellectual achievement. Authors, scientists, painters, and sculptors, musicians and actors mingled with politicians, diplomats, and statesmen. In the East Room, she had a portable stage built for memorable musical and dramatic performances, including a series of concerts for young people. Through her activities, Mrs. Kennedy instilled a new public regard for the arts. As White House hostess, Jacqueline Kennedy took a personal interest in the artists that performed for the President and his guests. The agreement of cellist Pablo Casals one of the most celebrated musicians of the 20th century, to play at the November 13, 1961 dinner at the White House for the governor of Puerto Rico was a great triumph. 
Casals had refused to play in the United States since the government had recognized the regime of dictator Francisco Franco of Spain, the cellist's native country. Not only would Casals break his personal embargo, but one of the world's most respected musicians would enhance the First Lady's quest for more uplifting entertainment at the White House. Casals, accompanied by pianist Mitislav Horchowski and violinist Alexander Schneider, performed a program of pieces by Mendelssohn, Schumann, and Couperin. No event exemplified her work more than the dinner held to honor the 49 living Nobel Prize winners of the Western Hemisphere on April 29, 1962. In his toast to the honored guests that evening, President Kennedy noted that it was the most extraordinary collection of talent of human knowledge that had ever been gathered together at the White House, with the possible exception of when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. Mrs. Kennedy accompanied her husband on trips to France, Austria, the United Kingdom, Venezuela, Mexico, Costa Rica, and Colombia, and also traveled as First Lady to Italy, Pakistan, and India. Her interest in the cultures of the country she visited and her fluency in languages made her a popular goodwill ambassador around the world. On November 22, 1963, John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, and Jacqueline Kennedy became a widow at age 34. She planned the president's state funeral, which was watched by millions around the world who shared her grief and admired her courage and dignity. Soon after President Kennedy's death, she began working to organize the John F. Kennedy Library, which would commemorate her husband's life. She chose then-unknown architect I.M. Pei to design the library and decided upon a striking location overlooking Boston Harbor. I hope you enjoy your visit to the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum and take home with you a greater appreciation of American history and culture that was championed by Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis during her lifetime.